I think we're recording. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, please give us eyes to see, ears to hear, that we may know the truth this morning. Amen. Representation. I've spent all my life working um, in one form or another as a, as a representative. I was a representative of Queen, I was going to say Queen and Country, no not Queen and Country, of the Queen, her government and the law of the land when I served as a police officer. I had left that job to become uh, a legal representative, defending and representing those held in custody at police stations. And now, in a, in a sense, I represent God in Christ and his church. Actually, I think it was only about a year ago, somebody said this to me. They said, ah, oh, so you've gone from arresting people to defending them to now saving them. <laughs> I, I quite like that. I'd never thought of it like that. Now, by representative, we mean an individual who represents, who's the representative of either an individual or a corporate body of people. Our Prime Minister, for example, represents us as a nation, all of us, in the EU, at least for a little longer. And often the fortunes of this individual representative dictate the fortunes of the masses. And this is precisely how it was in the days of old. And it's actually a, a key, consistent theme throughout the entire biblical narrative. Adam representing is the representative of all of mankind. Eve is the representative of all of womankind. Jacob was the representative of all Israel, and certainly was when he was wrestling with God. And Jesus is the representative of all humanity. And so it was when David stepped out to meet Goliath. The fate of the entire nations of Israel and the Philistines were dependent on the outcome of this confrontation. 1 Samuel 17 describes the armies of these two nations converging on two opposing hillsides. While the two representatives, uh, the chosen champions of each side, entered the valley below, like entering a vast natural colosseum. And there were these vast numbers on each hillside, gazing down upon the two gladiators, David and Goliath, as they confronted each other below. And we all know what happened. But this morning, I just want us to think about three particular aspects of this familiar story. Firstly, in brief, David's motivation. And secondly, um, a little bit more thoroughly, David's weaponry. And then thirdly, again briefly, I want to think about what is the greatest weapon. Those are the three things I want to think about. And hopefully, what I hope is that we'll see that there are some timeless, universal themes that are right at the core of this story. So firstly, David's motivation. Why does David get involved in this? No one asked him to. On the contrary, King Saul actually tries to dissuade him. So what motivates him? Goliath's defiance of God and the Israelites. Goliath had declared his defiance of Israel back in verse 10. And this defiance is mentioned twice more. And then David makes clear that he cannot stand idly by in the face of this. He says, verse 45, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So David, he wasn't even supposed to be in this battle. He's indignant at the defying of God's name. He's passionate about 
the honour and glory of God. The battle is the Lord's, he declares in verse 47. Astonishingly, he's not fearful, unlike everybody else. We read that Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified by Goliath. But not David. He's affronted, passionately bold. Because he wants that which defies God dealt with. So let's just turn and think about his weapons. David's weapons. This, I think, is a key thing. For the weapons that he, um, that he does and he doesn't use are extremely significant. It starts with irony. There's a real irony here. For Saul, the current king, was chosen and anointed because of his size and rigour. He was head and shoulders above the rest. Until now. Now, he's cowering on the hillside with the rest of the Israelites. And Goliath, on the other side of the hill, had been challenging and taunting the Israelites day and night for 40 days. So it's no surprise, I suppose, that Saul then tries to turn David into a mighty warrior himself. He says, Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armour on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. But David says, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. He takes them off. He's not looking to human weapons or human strength. But he's looking solely to God's. As we said a minute ago, the name of the Lord Almighty is his weapon. And yet Goliath is about to be defeated by David without a sword in his hand as the passage emphasises again in verse 50 without a sword in his hand now why does the narrator labour this point do you think I think it's because he's saying that David's weapon in effect was the sword of the spirit that's a term that Paul would later coin Uh, I'll come back to him shortly but think about a comparison with Jesus for a moment Jesus, as he was allowing himself to be arrested, would later say, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Don't you realise that my father could put at my disposal 12 legions of angels immediately if I asked him to? But the scriptures must be fulfilled, he said. It must happen my father's way. He's saying... If personal strength and power is what you seek, then you shall surely, eventually, die seeking it. But there is no death that comes from spiritual weaponry. No death that comes to those who fight in God's strength, that rely on him. He's saying, my way is weakness, submission and obedience. To my Father in heaven alone. Only through him will I conquer. And only through him, Jesus, who's won our victory for us. Only through him will we conquer. So both David and Jesus go into the battle weak in human terms. According to any human perspective. And they triumph, not in spite of their weakness, but because of their weakness. Consider this. And if you listen to nothing else this morning, just listen to this. Just listen to me now. There was a day around 3,000 years ago when a young shepherd, David from Bethlehem, God's human king, chooses to walk along a hillside leaving his men cowering behind him and though he's representing an entire nation he walks out alone in the name of the Lord to face and confront a seemingly insurmountable foe armed not with the weapons of this world but facing his foe 
in human weakness. And he triumphs. And there was a day 2,000 years ago when the Good Shepherd, Jesus from Bethlehem, God's divine King, he chooses to walk along a hillside, leaving his disciples cowering behind him. And though he's representing the entire world, he walks out alone in the name of the Lord to face and confront the seemingly insurmountable foe, sin and death and evil itself. And he's not armed with the weapons of this world, but he faces his foe in human weakness. And he triumphs. Do you see it? The victory comes in weakness because of the weakness. Because neither enemy could see any way in which they could possibly lose. Neither could see the power of God that comes through human submission. The strength in weakness, as Paul calls it. Incidentally, Paul was named after King Saul. Because Saul means great one. But just by changing one letter, an S to a P, Paul changed his name from great one to little one. Paul means little one. Because he knew this is how God does things. His power shines forth through the little, the weak, the dependent. Why? Because God wants everyone to know that real power comes only through him. Through dependence on him. Reliance on him. And obedience to him. And do you see how, see how David and Jesus were confronting the same thing? Goliath was the taunting, defiant enemy of the people of God who despised David. Now, what is sin? The defiance of God. In every form you could think of. Sin is the defiance of God. And it's the giant beast of this world. And Jesus conquers it. By allowing this giant evil to nail him to a wooden cross. That he might absorb and conquer it all on our behalf. I don't know if you can see it. Do you see it? He's our representative. Our champion. Do you know one of the things that marks out a Christian? Is the realisation that God doesn't save the world in the way that it wants to be saved. Not through great power and might and legions of warriors. No. No. God saves the world by taking off the armour, removing the sword, stripping himself naked and submitting himself. It's so counterintuitive to any human way of thinking that God actually reveals himself and his nature in this way. If you think about it, Um, Only a God, only the God could win this way. With nothing. Nothing in human terms. Just his way that transcends everything. Transcending even the power of the greatest giants that there have ever been. Even the great forces of darkness that roam this world. God needed no human weapons or armours to defeat them and no supernatural displays of his power. Just his personal intervention in Jesus and his submissive obedience. So self-giving is the way. Because it's only sacrifice and self-giving that conquers self-seeking. I really believe God wanted to show us that. That's his way. Not self-seeking. 
because it was our self-seeking that first caused our fall in Adam and Eve and has led to the world basically being in free fall ever since. Jesus disarms power of its power. Firstly, by disarming all the powers and giants of the earthly realm and the heavenly realms. And then secondly, he actually disarms our belief that power, strength and self-reliance are the way. Because he shows us that it's grace, sacrifice and reliance on God alone that is the way. To see it is to know God. No other proof is actually required. And yet Paul said this 2,000 years ago, it's as true then, today as it was then, that it remains for so many an absurdity. The cross is absurd to those that can't see God. Do you see it? If not, then come and take a closer look with me this Tuesday at 7 o'clock as we begin Alpha. Come and look. Lastly, briefly, I just want to look at uh, David's greatest weapon. Just briefly. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David says, Not by thy might, he's saying, not in my own strength, but by God's. God is the deliverer. And he has done so for us through his eternally appointed champion in Jesus Christ. Here's the one thing to notice. David's faith and the strength of it in the face of a, of a giant seemingly impossible to overcome, it's based on being able to look back on what God has done previously to deliver him. That's what he bases his faith on. So he can be sure that God will deliver him again. It matters not, not one jot, However huge or frightening the giant obstacle is in front of him. Now can we do that? You and I, can we do that? You bet we can. Go back to the cross. Go back to the cross. When you hear the phrase, take it to the cross, it's not just a trite, empty phrase. It means, if you can do that, meditate on the cross and know what it means... It means that you too can be full of faith and hope and conviction no matter what seemingly insurmountable giant obstacle you may be facing in life. Even death. What was the, the Last Supper all about? Next week, um, every other week, we take Holy Communion here. Jesus initiated the whole thing. Why? Why? So that we can remember. Remember, he said. So that we can remember what he did for us back then. And how it will deliver us. All of us. Now and in the future. And deliver us, it will, from death itself. Jesus has conquered the giant. For death itself, the last great giant enemy has been defeated. Thanks be to God. Amen.